Welcome back. In this session, I'd like to bring together a few of the things we've talked about in the last few data posts that I've had on the 2017 data into a number that we see all the time in finance, which is the cost of capital. In fact, I like to describe the cost of capital as the Swiss Army knife of finance. Why is Swiss Army knife? Because you can use it for so many different reasons. In corporate finance, which is one of those topics that I'm immersed in, I find it showing up all of the time. So when companies make investment decisions, it is the hurdle rate that you use to decide whether to take projects, that proverbial discount rate in a capital budgeting project. Within companies, it's an optimizing device to decide what the right mix of debt and equity is. And within companies, it becomes a divining rod to de decide whether a company should be returning cash to its investors or not. To the extent that the investments don't make your cost to capital, you should be giving the cash back. Now, I also teach valuation. Valuation, of course, it shows up as the discount rate when you do a DCF. It also plays in the background when you talk about EV to EBITDA multiples or EV to sales multiples. So cost of capital shows up everywhere, and it's perhaps because it's used in so many different contexts by so many different types of, so many subgroups of people that I think it's a vastly misunderstood number. It is an opportunity cost, it is a hurdle rate, and it is also a discount rate. And people wonder, how can it do all of this stuff? So let's step back and think about what it is that goes into a cost of capital. The cost of capital is the cost of raising equity and debt in market today to fund your operations. So if you think about what goes into a cost of equity, of course, you have a risk-free rate from which you build off and a risk premium you're going to attach, which is going to be higher for riskier equities and lower for safer equities. The cost of debt is that same risk-free rate plus a default spread, reflecting the concerns that lenders have that you won't pay them back. And of course, to the extent that the tax laws give you a tax benefit from debt, it shows up as an after-tax cost of debt. The cost of equity and the cost of debt get weighted by however much of each you use in funding your operations. That's pretty straightforward, right? So the start of every year, including this one, I compute the cost of capital for every company. Now that's 42,668 companies and I have to some, uh, cut some corners, make some broad assumptions to be able to get this done. So here's how I computed the cost of capital at the start of 2017. First, I decided to do all of the cost of capital for all of the companies in the US, in U.S. dollars. Not because I wanted to be parochial, but we know it's easy once you get a U.S. dollar cost of capital to convert to any other currency. The risk-free rate on January 1st, 2017 was the, that I used was the 10-year T-bond rate of 2.45%. So that's my starting point for every single company. Second, I looked up a beta for a company. Now, you can debate me about whether you like betas or don't like betas. I would concede the argument to you, but if you have a better measure of relative risk, go ahead and use it. But to me, beta is just a measure of relative risk. A beta one means you're an average risk company. Above one means you're above average risk. And below one means you're below average risk. Of course, the way we're all taught to estimate betas is to run regressions for individual companies against the index. I do have those regression betas, but I wouldn't trust them further than I can throw them. So what I do as a and this is a practice I adopt both in corporate finance and valuation, is I use the sector averages. Remember, these sectors are across 42,668 companies. If you're a steel company, I use the beta across steel companies. What does it accomplish for me? First, the law of large numbers means that no individual beta is throwing me off. Second, I'm saying a steel company is a steel company no matter where you operate. Now, of course, I adjust for the fact that your debt-to-equity ratio, the amount of leverage you use, might be very different from the rest. So the beta for an individual company then becomes this bottom-up beta. The equity risk premium that I use is the equity risk premium for the country you're incorporated in. Let me pause right there because when you look at that calculation, I'm already breaking a couple of the rules I push in my corporate finance classes. In my corporate finance class, I argue that the beta for a company should reflect not just the one business that I put it in, but the multiple business it operates in. So Disney's beta is going to be a function of the entertainment business, the theme park business, the movie business, the broadcasting business. So four different businesses. You think, why aren't you doing that? Because my database doesn't allow me to easily find that breakdown across businesses. And the equity risk premium that I use, I don't have a breakdown by country or region easily in my database. So I will concede that these are shortcuts, but across the companies, I'm going to use these shortcuts. Now, to get to the cost of debt, I start with the same risk-free rate, the US dollar risk-free rate, and I add a default spread. And here's how I come up with the default spread. If I can find a rating for your company, a bond rating from S&P, I use that rating to estimate a default spread. So that makes my life easy. If I cannot find 
a bond rating, then I use your interest coverage ratio to estimate a rating and a default spread. Now I add on a component to it. If you're a company in a risky country, let's say you are an Argentine company or an Indian company, in addition to the default spread of the company, add the default spread for the country, arguing that you carry both burdens on your shoulder. So I've got my risk-free rate, I've got my risk premiums for equity and debt, I do use the marginal tax rate again of the country in which the company is incorporated to come up with my cost of debt. So you can see the shortcuts I've used. One beta for the entire company, even though it's in multiple businesses, the equity risk premium of the country of incorporation rather than the countries that you operate, and a marginal tax rate based on the country you're incorporated in. I'm going to use these to come up with a cost of cap for a company, but I'll give you an escape hatch if you want a more precise estimate for the cost of cap for an individual company. I have a spreadsheet and I'll put up the link on this, po on this post where if you can go into the spreadsheet, I'll let you break down your company into multiple businesses, break it down to multiple regions and do it right. But this approach allows me, it's a bludgeon approach, it gives me a cost of capital for 42,668 companies. Now here's what I did with it. First I looked at how cost of capital vary across countries. And you can see that the green sections of this map are the countries where the cost of capital is actually less than 8%. Some you expect to see, you know, the U.S., Canada. Some of you might be surprised. You look at Chile, you look at Mexico, there, and these are all U.S. dollar cost of capital. So I've essentially categorized the world from low cost of capital countries to high cost of capital countries. If you're saying, why do cost of capital vary across countries? Well, it's got to be one of four reasons. The first and the biggest factor is country risk. Because I attach the equity risk premium for the country of incorporation to every company in that country, if you're in a risky country, let's say Iraq or Syria, your cost of capital is going to be higher than if you're in a safe country. So that's the first and biggest factor. The second is when you look at the types of companies within each country, Chile, for instance, has a lot of commodity companies. What you're going to get as a weighted average cost of capital of the country is going to disproportionately reflect the businesses in that country. The third is the marginal tax rate to the extent that it lowers your cost of debt. The cost to cap for U.S. companies is lower simply because the marginal tax rate in the U.S. is higher than it is elsewhere in the world. You get a bigger tax benefit. And finally, the amount of debt that companies use varies across the world, and that in turn affects the cost of capital. So you can see why costs of capital vary across countries. Now let's look at cost of capital across sectors. I took global sectors of about, uh, about 94, and I looked for the 10 sectors with the lowest cost of capital and the 10 with the highest. And you can see the list here. So not surprisingly, you see a lot of utilities, you know, food wholesalers, power. So essentially, you see sectors you'd expect to see. And gross, so if you want to think about why these sectors tend to have low cost of capital, one suggestion I would have is to think about how discretionary their products and services are. To the extent that they're not, that people have to use, buy food and they have to use power, you're not surprisingly going to see low cost of capital. At the other end of the spectrum, you have the companies with the highest cost of capital. Use technology, not surprisingly, shows up there. Retail online shows up there. Think of this as more, perhaps more the more discretionary part of retail. Biotech companies show up there. So you, you're essentially seeing variations in cost of capital across sectors. Again, if you want to see how cost of capital vary across sectors and you want to see the entire list, feel free to use the link again to, to this particular session to see what those numbers look like, both for the U.S. and any part of the world that you're interested in, including a global sample. Now let's talk about why there are differences across sectors. The first, of course, is business risk. I talked about how some businesses produce more discretionary products and services, and they should have higher betas. The second is leverage differences. In some sectors, companies are able to borrow more money. And because they're able to borrow more money, their cost of capital are lower. Of course, they're able to borrow more money in these sectors because the sectors tend to be safer, you have more cash flows. And the third is some sectors are more exposed to some countries than others. So if you're a commodity company, you might be exposed more to the riskiest parts of the world, which pushes up your cost of capital. So you're wondering why oil and gas companies might have higher cost of capital to the extent that oil and gas happens to be in the riskiest parts of the world. Perhaps that's not so surprising. So at, at this point, you should have a sense of differences in cost of capital across countries and differences across sectors. Now let's think about differences across companies. One of the things I find very useful to gain perspective, and let me explain what I mean by gaining perspective. Often when you sit down to value a company and you come up with the cost of capital, 9, 10, 14, you look at that number and say, is that a high number? Is that a low number? Is that a typical number? 
I don't know the answer to the question. So to kind of get myself some perspective on what a high, low, or an average number is, I put up a histogram. Basically, I take all 42,668 companies in my sample. I compute a cost of cap for each one, and then I count the number of companies with cost of cap less than 4%, 4 to 4.5. And, and this distribution basically captures both for U.S. companies and global companies what the distribution looks like. And it's revealing. And here's why it's revealing. First, the median cost of capital for U.S. companies is about 7.22%. And no surprise there, the risk-free rate is 2.45%. Here are the numbers that jump out at you. 50% of all U.S. companies, you take the 25th and the 75th percentile, have cost of capital between 5.66 and 8.14%. That's not much room to run. In fact, 80% of all U.S. companies have cost of capital between 4.59 and 8.87%. That's it. This is the number that we spend hours and days trying to estimate. Look at the distribution. In fact, if you go global, you do expand the distribution, but not by much. The median cost of capital in U.S. dollar terms for a global company is 8.03%. 50% of all global companies have cost of capital between 688 and 9.15%. 80% of all global companies have cost of capital between 5.6 and 10.7%. Again, not that much room to run. So here are some closing thoughts on the cost of capital. Take them for what they're worth. The first is, in lots of valuations, I see cost of capital become the receptacles for all of the analysts' hopes and fears. So here's what I mean by that. I'll see analysts valuing a really good company, and because it's a company they like, they'll want to lower their cost of capital. There's a hope playing out. Or they'll be valuing a company and they're worried, they're scared about you know, bad things happening to the company. They'll push up the discount rate. There's a fear factor playing out. Unfortunately, cost of capital are very difficult to intuit. What I mean by that is you can't just look at a company and guess a cost of capital. Making up cost of capital often results in risks that should not be counting in becoming part of your cost of capital. Risks that are very company specific that should get diversified away, you start building into your cost of capital and you start attaching prices to those risks that come from your gut rather than from the market. Second, when your valuation goes wrong, I'm not suggesting that's an objective you should aim for, but valuations sometimes go wrong. It's almost never because you got the discount rate massively wrong. It's because you got the cash flows wrong. Those revenue growth rates, the margins you assume, the reinvestment were wrong, and that's why your valuation is wrong. It follows then that if you're spending a lot of time in your valuation estimating the cost of capital, which is what I see often in valuation, is analysts spending 75, 80 percent of their time tweaking the cost of capital. You're misusing your time. That time should be better spent on the cash flows. I have a very simple rule of thumb. If I'm spending more than 25 percent of my time in evaluation estimating the cost of capital, I've lost my way. And finally, if you're in a hurry to value a company, I'll make a suggestion to you. And this might sound very unscientific. So let's say I have only an hour to value a company. Here's what I'm going to do. It's an average risk company. I'm going to use an 8% cost of capital. Remember, the median for global companies is 8.03%. And I'm going to finish the valuation. And if I have time, I'm going to come back and revisit the cost of capital. If it's a risky company, I might use the 90th percentile or the 75th percentile. I found this works most of the time. And in fact, with young growth companies where there's not a whole lot of history and the business itself is evolving, the Ubers and the Facebooks of the world, you might be in much better shape using this approach of drawing on the distribution and making your best valuation rather than sitting there finessing the beta or tweaking the equity risk premium or deciding whether to use the 20-year T-bond rate or the 10-year T-bond rate. You have far better things to do with your time. Thank you very much for listening.